beat two, three, four, and there he is. What is going on, my man John? Nico Moreno from uh, Pulso Sports in the Soccer Bar hanging out with us till the top of the hour. And, uh, yeah, we were getting into, before before you came in uh, this morning, uh, one of our one of our intrepid listeners who who has a history in, in media uh, was raising the question of pronouncers and how it appears that a lot of a lot of the time, sadly, we don't do our homework and we just say names that are wrong. And other than it being not cool, it just shows a, a lack of research. And it's, and it seems that there are times where there are announcers that either don't want to, they don't want to learn or they don't practice or they don't ask the question. And it's disappointing when you have folks with families and family histories and the ancestry that's attached to their names it's incumbent upon us in this business to get it right and to do something as simple as pronouncing somebody's name correctly. And folks, we're getting off on that tangent as, you know, as we are prone to do, but yeah, that's what we were getting into before you came in this morning, Nico. Yeah, no, I, I think it just shows the difference um, in the professionalism of each individual. Um, I'm far from perfect. And uh, especially when, your bilingual speaker, uh, the way you pronounce something in Spanish is very different of when you do it in English. So you do have to figure out exactly how to get it right. Um, but that pronunciation, like here in Seattle, uh, Albert Rusneck, uh, he's typically called Rusneck constantly. But I like what you said. It's as simple as asking, how do you pronounce your name? And we actually asked him and he said, it's Rusneck. Mm -hmm. So uh, ever since I do my very best, to always call him Rust Knight. But, but but yes, I think it just it needs to be corrected. It needs to be done right. Uh, it's okay to get it wrong, but then go ahead and do the research and get it right the next time, right? Don't just ignore it and say, hey, that's the way I pronounce it. Um, so yes, it is something that everyone that is, is either in broadcasting or, or even in commentary, uh, just like us analyzing the week or whatever, you should try to do your very best to get these guys' names right. It bugs the hell out of me, Nico. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, look, I, I work with a guy that's very by the book when it comes to that, and he helps me out a lot. Um, he, either he calls me out right off the bat or, you know, we'll have the conversation later. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's something that, that does need to be addressed, and, and it does make you better. It, it makes you better. As simple as that. If you do this and you're trying to do it right, uh, you got to get those names correctly. All right, so we had uh, midweek, and it was the standard amount of midweek chaos in uh, Major League Soccer. And let's let's just plow right into uh, red light, yellow light, green light. I mean, you had Cali, and this is just in the West Coast games. Cali Classico, we were talking about it yesterday, and the total changed from minus to plus in the juice boxes at three and a half, or more like three and a quarter. And we were like, run with that all day long, and it went to five. So you know, those who... Listen to us with that particular total in mind. Had fun. Uh, I did not have Portland and uh, Zomb I did not have Zombie Timbers getting a result against RSL. Uh, you had all caps get a win. Houston continues their, their elements. Vancouver on the road at Chicago. And Seattle and Austin. And I know that I want to get into to that one with you as well. Where do you want to start? Red light, yellow light, or green light? What direction do you want to go? Uh, let's start with the red light. And it, it was kind of a, 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 a mid week, uh, set of games where the, the visiting teams kind of, uh, showed their guns and, and, and really came out there and, 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 and beat on the home teams. Uh, either they flipped the score or they were able to hold on to results. But, uh, it, it seems like in this particular, uh, week it was about the visiting teams shocking the home teams uh so yeah let, let's start with colorado as the red team right i mean that's an easy one they're like uh plain toast no jam no jelly no peanut butter just toast and and it's hard to watch um hard to eat they are, hard to watch what's up Hard to eat and hard to watch. Right? Hard to eat, hard to watch. I mean, this is a team that uh, has only won uh, one of their last 10 games in all competitions. They've been outscored 11-1 to 1 in the last three. 
uh, they uh, continue to revert to the exact same tactics. Um, that's okay. You gotta, you know, believe that what you're working on is going to eventually produce, but uh, with the firepower or limited or lack thereof, if you will, uh, it's just hard to see them get any better. And they continue to run into this exact same wall. Uh, and if you are not doing well offensively, and we talked about this in the past with Colorado, then you have to correct it on defense or put a, put everything you got on just making it hard for the other team. But they haven't even been able to do that. So uh, in this game against um, uh, Minnesota, they get uh, completely uh, demolished. Um, they uh, have absolutely no midfield. They're allowing Reynoso to get in all his favorite spots. They're allowing uh, this Minnesota team to get forward uh, – one, two, three minutes conducting before anybody can ever smell what type of body spray the guy is using. So it's it, it was just a, a a really hard game to watch when he came to Colorado. Uh, I did put it on last night because I I wanted to see uh, Minnesota. I think they're they're a very hot and cold team at times. Uh, they depend obviously a lot on what Reynosa does, uh, but they're starting to come together. So it's a team that I'm watching. Uh, but yeah, all around Colorado, just terrible. Yellow light. And once again, our parameters here uh, are twofold. It can be a team going from red improving toward green. It can be a team that is degrading from green heading toward red. You can use a repeat team, but you have to come up with a different reason. Who's your yellow light this week? Yeah, I'm going to give you a new one, uh, and it's going to be uh, maybe one that you might enjoy. Um, and it's the Philadelphia Union. Okay. Uh, you can go out there and allow Toronto to just dominate you because they, they, they did that out. They outdoled them. They were a team that, uh, I don't know, felt like they could – Outpossess you. Uh, they they were the more dangerous team all around. It seemed like the Union uh, were lost on the field. Uh, they would try to get the ball, and then when it came down to transition, it seemed like guys would look at spots where they're usually players making runs, and there was nobody making runs. So they have to bring the ball all the way back, and you start to create this possession without purpose. And then Toronto, not just they don't just get the three goals, but it could have been you know, maybe four or maybe five in, in this particular game. So I'm not used to seeing Philadelphia as disorganized and without the answer to questions on the field as I have in this particular game. Uh, and then we've seen it before in League's Cup where, once again, once they get far behind or maybe their their initial plan as um, – a team that wants to play very organized doesn't quite work and they begin to get plucked away and uh, kind of chopped through and, and broken down, uh, then they just don't really have any answers. And against Toronto, Toronto, a team that doesn't win since May, you allow that to happen uh, and you're allowing Bernadeschi to get the ball behind your your, your back line uh, with anybody touching them. Uh, I just find it concerning. So I'm going to bring them down from a green where they've been most of the season to a yellow. Okay, so then since you've dragged Philly down to the yellow, who is your green light this week? See, that's that's the tough one uh, because we've had so many of those green teams kind of come up and stay the same. Um, and and I, I don't want to repeat, especially uh, in, in the teams in the in the East, which, you know, I, I would probably go for um, when we're talking about about Cincinnati, because. Uh, Look, it was it was a good game against Atlanta uh, for them to kind of revert that, and uh, I really thought Atlanta was going to get away with it and 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 do what they do best, and uh, especially lately, you know, with these new additions and, and try to beat down Cincinnati, but they really couldn't do it. Um, so, with the sense of not going to get over Cincinnati again, um, I'm going to change it up, and I am going to fit back. St. Louis up top of that green list. They were yellow. We're going to move into green. Uh, Klaus was back. That was interesting. That's a guy that they've missed a lot. Uh, that's a guy that um, does seem to make a difference whenever he comes on the pitch. Uh, so it's going to be uh, a team that, for me, 
they've already showed us that even without those pieces, they can remain up. I, I thought, and and we'll see what happens in, in the last games of the season, that maybe it would not be enough, and maybe they would begin to get exposed. And they have at times. They really have at times. But now with, with Klaus back and a couple of the performances they've shown lately, uh, I feel confident in putting back in the green light category. All right, so I've got two other topics in in this that I wanted to get into. Austin, and this gives you the chance to talk about the Seattle match. Uh, Austin is now below the playoff bar. And if I'm Josh Wolf, I'm thinking my spidey senses are uh, kind of putting me on alert here a little bit. Austin just continues to, and you mentioned the Diego Fagundes transaction is possibly a part of this too. But Austin seems to be falling and falling and falling, and now they're below the playoff bar. What did you take away from the match against Seattle? Well, I got to credit Seattle first. Uh, I mean, this was a heavily rotated Sounders team, uh, a team with a lot of baggage when it comes to results not going their way, with the locker room not vibing together and on the field there's uh, no communication in between each other. A lot of frustration in terms of body language from one player to another. And yet in this one, they come in, they change things up. Nicolas Odero has a fantastic game here. Uh, just the way he covered the pitch, uh, his ability to get guys forward, uh, putting the ball in dangerous positions all game long, whether it was in crosses or through balls. Um, I thought it was one of his best performances of the season. Uh, he plays the entire game. Uh, th there's a point where he's playing so far out left that uh, he's coming back almost as a, as a wing back defending in the 87th, 88th minute. I mean, this is a guy that is 30 plus years old and that, you know, he might no longer be in Seattle and he's giving you absolutely all this effort. Uh, Stephen Fry was unreal. Uh, that be, uh, double save he had, it, it, one of which is a diving switch arm uh, dive. I mean, it, it was just so good. So uh, I think Seattle did a lot of things right to expose uh, Austin, um, specifically in transition. Um, in possession, they were very purposeful with the, with possession. Uh, I thought Josh Atencio really freed that front line a lot. Uh Sometimes JP, uh, you know, he's having to cover so much space and he can only do it so much. Uh, I think that physicality and, and that rangy play from Atencio really freed that front line, uh, specifically Nicolas Ladero, who just seemed higher up the field, a lot closer to Jordan Morris, who played nine in this one. Um, I thought the white play stayed wide and, and uh, they stretched out uh, Austin. But when it comes to the one-on-one -on -one defending for Austin, it's still tough to watch because uh, Kante up and down, Nick Lima very poorly d d defensively. Um, I, I don't know if that's his forte, quite honestly. Um, Matt Hedges did okay, but he had to come off. But uh, I thought Matt Hedges did well. And then that midfield, uh, Johan Valencia continues to be, I don't want to call him a bust, but he just hasn't lived up to my expectation of what, the impact of his play would do for Austin. Uh, and then Wolf there, uh, it's not his um, sense of play to be that guy that disturbs, that cuts play. Uh, so they don't really have anybody that's going to filter uh, in that holding midfield line. So they're very subjective to just easy balls and, and easy uh, transition. Uh, and I think that's what's going on with Austin. The Fagundes thing, I thought it was completely mismanaged. Uh, not sure what's going on or what happened, but it just seemed like he was shipped out uh, because there was no chemistry or something going on with um, the, the head coach, Wolf. So we'll, we'll really see what happened there. But I think he's in the hot seat. Uh, this team has gotten everything that they wanted in terms of your shopping list of players that you want to get. And yet, there's been some digression from the very first season where they were bad and then second season they do a lot better and then they just aren't able to get past a certain point and you're starting to see that. If they don't make the playoffs, which it doesn't seem like they might, and they continue to play this poorly, I can see him gone. Speaking of coaches, 
You know, maybe, maybe, just perhaps, maybe possibly, perhaps, possibly. Toronto got the new coach in the building bump, John Herdman. Now he's going to take over October 1st as he transitions and helps the transition at Canada Soccer for the new head of the men's national team. But John Herdman, who has no history of coaching on the club level, he just went from like New Zealand youth to Canada women to Canada men. Now, Bill Manning in Toronto thinks that uh, bringing in a guy like John Herdman will put butts in the seats, turn Toronto into this hub for Canada soccer, try and attract those big names that apparently might be mad at John Herdman on a national team level. I don't know why you would want to play for somebody who, you know, angers you as your national team coach. John Herdman is now the head coach in Toronto. What did you think when that, because we talked about the rumors and everything, but now that it's officially official, John Herdman, now the boss starting October 1st in Toronto. Uh, As we said, I don't think he, I don't think he fits. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, Sometimes you want a guy that comes with the right accolades and uh, maybe brings a little sunshine of his own. And that's not what you get here, right? You're coming in from uh, a place that needs to be revamped and rejuvenated. And I don't see his philosophy and style to be that of a player that can, of that of a coach that can really either mold the younger players and deal and squeeze the talent and what, the, those superstars can provide. So I just don't get it. I, I'm not a fan of it. Um, as we said before, the issues in Toronto are way beyond the coaching staff. Uh, so I think he's just another Lego block. Uh, and he eventually is going to be removed and they're going to have to bring another one. Once you start putting this together and you figure out that your foundation is made out of Legos and you need to figure that out. So um it, it, all in all, I don't see Toronto being any better than they were before. Uh, if you want to ask me, I mean, you're downgrading on coaching. If we're talking about Bob, I mean, that's just my personal take on it. So I just don't understand it, and I don't think it's going to work. Well, because, I mean, and what we've talked about is at the same time, the dangers of giving someone like you did with Bob, both the head coach and the general manager, position, sporting director, technical director, whatever. I mean, we've seen it with Bill Parcells. We've seen it in American football a lot. Uh, which cup of coffee? Are you in your second cup of coffee, sir, or are you on your first? Uh, this is my first, actually. It's my first. I, I slept in a little bit today. Uh, my uh, son helped me take out my dog. Um, so, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good morning. I'm very relaxed today. Okay. Nothing wrong with being chill. And that's why we bring up John Herdman, just to, to get you drive, driven crazy. But, I mean – the key here, I think, is not to turn over all of the keys to the car to one dude. And we saw what happened when you did that with Bob, and it was a, a mistake of just massive proportions when we're talking about what happened in Toronto. And you wonder how much control Herdman has either asked for or is going to get. I mean, you'd hope that they learn from previous mistakes, right? And I'm with you. I think checks and balances are important in any sport. Uh, and you, you don't want your head coach making absolutely all the decisions because, honestly, the, the collective unit is what makes it work, you know? And you need guys to keep each other accountable. And you need guys that have a different perspective. Uh, when you're talking about sometimes you need a second pair of eyes that that goes very into soccer because you could be blinded by a specific player that you want or a specific system. And if you don't have someone else saying, Hey man, I know you like this guy, but we really need a winger or, Hey man, I know you like that forward, but heck, we got no center backs here in Toronto. Then, you know, you, you, you need to have somebody to let you, you know that absolutely. And it just, it hasn't worked. Uh, I mean, sometimes it works. Bruce has done it correctly at times and th- there are your exceptions but all in all I-, I always think that any organization needs to have a sporting director gm or maybe gm president of soccer and all of that because each one of those guys is going to bring a different perspective and is going to make you a-, a better more complete organization and-, and that's just the way it is all right five minute warning we're going to go through uh, the upcoming games here this weekend 
And if there's a match you want to talk about, it's where we go into cliffhanger. And we run through all of the games before we go into the uh, the international window, save for that one game on the ninth with Minnesota and the Revs. It's a bit of a makeup. Uh, NYC hosting Vancouver. NYC's even money at 3.30 on Saturday afternoon. 7.39s. Montreal hosting crew. Montreal at Stad Saputo is a home favorite at a plus 141. D.C. and Chicago. D.C.'s on the minus side at a minus 115. Fire or a plus 285. Cincinnati and the purple team at 730. Cincinnati, they clinched the playoff spot. Cincinnati's at a minus 114. Draws a plus 260. And Orlando is a plus 307 in the composite. What say you? Yeah, let's hold that. Uh, uh, I like the draw on this one. Uh, you just saw with Orlando that they're a team that at times they knock themselves down from what they could be doing, essentially. Uh, Cincinnati, man, they, they uh, like I said earlier, they just, they've been impressive in the way they play. But you could perhaps see a little bit of downshift in here uh, because you know and you understand that the – Supporter Shield winner rarely wins uh, the cup. And although they might get that, just continuing to play on fourth year, uh, I don't think you want to overextend yourself, but you might want to rotate a little bit. Uh, they did a little rotation this weekend as well. I mean, uh, yesterday in midweek play. Uh, so uh, how much do you see in this particular game? I do still, they can... Either way, give Orlando a lot of problems. So I like the draw, especially for those odds on this one. Uh, I get some uh, juice boxes out of the back of the fridge for now. All right. Revs, there are minus 132 hosting Austin at 730. Your 830s, uh, FC Dallas and 97 degree temps is hosting Atlanta United. That one's going to be an interesting one. Dallas is a plus 127. Atlanta United is a plus 202. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Mm. Draws, uh, draws a plus 250. No, uh, look, uh, I think Atlanta can can give Dallas a lot of problems. Uh, I mean, you just kind of saw it against St. Louis, a team that doesn't have the firepower that uh, Atlanta does, uh, but that can hit you with a lot of the dynamic play. Uh, Dallas is a team that their rest defense is very poor. You know, they've had some injuries in the center back position. I think their wing backs as well. Uh, don't provide you the m most confidence in, in terms of defense. Uh, so I think Atlanta in this one could be a, a heavy winner for me. Uh, I, I would even think, what's the over-under on goals in this one? Well, let's see. When when does it change? That's the big question. When does it change? Correctly. So let's see. Over-under flips to a positive at basically a plus two, two and three quarters. So if you go three, it's at a plus 141, three and a half, so plus 206. So three and a half, three and a half, so plus 206. It changes at plus 2.75. Two and a half, so minus 122, two and three quarters is a plus 104. So no, three. I'll take the three and a half. I'll take the three and a half. Call me crazy, but I'll take the three and a half in this one. Uh, you know, Pi has just got a, a very silly red card. I mean, it was it, there. There are goalkeepers that are meant to be out of the box. There are others that that don't. And if you can't figure out whether you should just forget whatever the player closer to the ball is doing, if he's not listening to you, if he's not seeing you, just go out there and just kill that ball. And even if you have to give your own team a little bit of a shove, but you got to get the ball out. You can't just hesitate and then trip on your own feet and then have to hit the ball with your hands. Um, but like I said, I think when it comes to the defense, uh, that back line, uh, both the entire back line, I, I don't think that they give you much confidence. Plus uh, the, the red card to the goalkeeper, I can see this game being a, a, a really good game for Atlanta. No doubt. Uh, Jimmy Maurer in net as opposed to Pice. Uh, home favorites, Nashville against Charlotte, sporting against all caps, RSL, big favorite at a minus 147 with Colorado, LAG at a minus 108 as the Dynamo come to town, San Jose at a plus 104 as Minnesota comes to town. You've got Cascadia, Seattle, and Portland at a minus 145. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we could sit here and talk about that LA Galaxy Houston. I think it's going to be a good one, uh, but I'm not, not going to talk about the Cascadia rivalry. Um, I think Houston in this one is still a heavy favorite. I wouldn't put money in it. Uh, what's the, the numbers on Houston Galaxy just real quick? Plus 259 for Houston. Plus 259 for Houston? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind putting money there. Look, I know the LA Galaxy is coming from a from a from a couple of, of good games. They got some new pieces in, and uh, they seem to be revived a little bit. Uh, but Houston is just too good right now. They're in too good of a streak. Uh, Cole Carasquilla is, is just a different man. You know, he just evolved into this superstar this season. And, and and we've talked about Houston enough for you guys to know why I think Houston would win that game. Now, Seattle, Portland, that's a good one. Uh, I mean, that's. El Clasico of Clasicos in MLS, if you ask me. Portland, Geoless is the way I put it. Uh, Geo, he put his hand down. I mean, he he was, he was owned the Sounders. Ever since Giovanni Salvarez took over, Brian Smetzer and Seattle Sounders were unable to beat that team. Uh, I do believe that he was a, a big part of, of knowing how to plan games, uh, how to execute them, uh, how to minimize what Seattle does correctly. Uh, there was a little bit of a mind game between him and, and Brian uh, that now is gone. Seattle's coming in from building some momentum. Maybe so are they, right, with uh, a, a surprising win over RSL. Um, in paper, in paper, you could say, you could argue that Portland is the better team, uh, but I think the Seattle Sounders, when it comes to having that core group that – has probably been dying to finally get a win against Portland. I think they're going to go all out in this one. Uh, as long as there are no injuries, I really do believe that Seattle is finally going to break that wall down and get a win over Portland. All right, then we wrap up. Union are at home on Sunday, favored against Red Bulls. And the weekend finishes LAFC against Messi and friends. LAFC is a minus 101. Messi and friends are a plus 245. Yeah, I feel like that's a trap game. Uh, to, to, to me, when it comes to that, the, uh, when it comes to the juice boxes, not not trap game at all, because, you know, uh, I, I really do think that LAFC uh, is either going to pull it off or they're going to draw. I mean, you just saw what um, uh, maybe a more exhausted Messi and, and, and friends looks like uh, against Nashville that – they played this game a lot differently. Uh, I mean, they were going out there and just hitting uh, uh, th this uh, inner Miami FC team, hitting Messi. Dax is trying to, like, tackle uh, Lionel Messi, trying to pull down his, his shorts. I mean, it, it, it was definitely a, a game where I think Nashville figured out that they'd have to play with a different sort of mentality, and uh, they made it difficult for him. And – you start to see the how much you need certain players for inner Miami. I thought Taylor uh, was not not great in this one. Uh, Joseph Martinez looked tired. Uh, I think Messi, who does his walk in and and, and then performs obviously because that's what he does. He just looks for those moments. He didn't get a lot of moments. Uh, so can LAFC and Chirundolo maybe make them defend and and get them more tired, press them, uh, use uh, the speed of Buanga to get behind, uh, whether it's uh, Alba or um, Jelen on that on that side. Uh, I think they can really do it. They, they have the weapons to bring it to Miami. So I see LAFC. I wouldn't put any money on it on this one particularly, but I think that LAFC could either win it or, or draw this game. All right, so then Jason Nix asks, where do you think Geo lands, MLS, Liga MX, or someplace else? I think he'll stay in MLS. I think that's where his highest value is. Um, I've mentioned that he uh, indicated in several talks that we've had with him that he uh, had ambitions to coach a national team, but I don't know if there's any vacancies at this moment that, where he really fits. Uh, he's wanted to coach the Venezuela national team for a very long time. That's somewhere where I'm sure he'd look, but not sure if he would get that job right now. On the contrary, in MLS, there's a ton of teams that could use him that would want to have him. Uh, uh, RSL is one of them that if, depending what happens with Pablo, would love to have a guy like Gio that 
uh, has a, a rapport with South American players that gives you a little bit more uh, that, you know, has been as successful as he has in the Western Conference. Um, I think Orlando, depending on what happens with Oscar Pereja, could look at a guy like Giovanni Savarese. Uh, so there's just a lot of teams all around this league that I think could benefit from having a guy like Gio. Uh, so because of his value, how he knows the league, and how relevant he's been over you know, the last 10 years, I, I believe that he, he's going to stay in MLS. All right, what's going on, Soccer Bar and Pulso Sports, my friend? All right, Soccer Bar, today... Uh, two, uh, one o'clock Pacific time. We'll go back, look at all these games. We also have a couple of uh, sound bites from uh, players all around the league in terms of uh, this Wednesday uh, week uh, of games, if you will. Fecha, we call it in, in Spanish. Um, we're going to do some really good debating uh, on some of these teams and can LA make the push to, to the playoffs? Can Miami? Uh, do wonders and even with this draw get there uh so some really good debating in pulso we'll be following up everything that has to do with this cascade rivalry we'll have a bunch of sounds and interviews with uh players all around um and of course uh you cannot miss out on what's going to happen after the game and all those um frequencies that you might get out of that uh cascadia team we're going to have people on the uh stands and at the march just to get you guys some of that feel so check out postal sports for that one he's nico i'm nelly that's another round on thursdays as great as always to catch up with you nico my friend we are out the door we'll be back at it again 905 Appreciate it, my guy